for courses exploring the foundation of modern philosophy, as well as live events bringing philosophy to life, visit philosophyportal.online and become a member today. Throughout 2024, our members get access to four monthly events, and also access to all historical recordings from our previous private events, including events with Lehman Pascal, Alenka Zupancic, Elliot Rosenstock, Carl Hayden Smith, David McCarricker, Alex Ebert, Andrew Davis, Ruth Kastner, and Matthew Segal. Find out more at philosophyportal.online. Welcome to another Singularities podcast. I'm here today with a special guest, Javier Rivera. He's been on the channel a few times before. We discussed dating as well as there's a collective conversation with Alex Ebert and Chitan Anand uh, on teachers and idols. Um, so you can check that out in the in the back catalog if you're interested. Javier Rivera also produces his own work on on a self-titled YouTube channel, which I'll link in the description, as well as his own writings on Substack, which I'll also leave a link in the description. Um, and as is sort of um, customary, I suppose, of what I'm trying to do with the Singularities podcast is trying to open up a style of mm, conversation, um, a style of relating which is focused on the personal story and focused on the singularity of, of, of an individual's life story as a window or a vehicle into um, modeling perhaps the way we can get to know better each other's personal relationships to whether we want to say God or whether we want to say religion or whether we want to say something transcendent, whatever, pointing in, in let's say, that direction. So welcome, Javier. Uh, it's been a while since we last had a conversation, but I sort of want to start with maybe take into consideration, say, the whole of you and sort of emphasize where where do you feel your story starts when I say the word religion or when I say the word God? Like, where does that bring you to in your in your memory or... Yeah, maybe that's all all I want to say. <laughs> uh, thank you, Cadell. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so cool. We're going to free associate. Yeah, I like this. The first thing that came up was my mother, really. Um, I would say my mother was the beginning of my interactions with religion in general. Um, but I think the only religious understanding that I had was really prohibitions things I can't do, things I can do. Um, since I grew up Seventh-day Adventist, um, good old, <laughs> good old like 17th century American religion, um, I had to, like, was it, we went to church on Saturdays, not Sundays. So that was already a very weird part of my childhood of like, I don't understand why I can't hang out with my friends on Saturdays. And everybody goes to church on Sundays, so this is really weird. You know, we're the only ones that go to church on Saturdays. I don't understand. <laughs> and I think my my first, literally, my mom told me, she goes, just go to the dictionary and look up Saturday. And she's like, and you'll see that it was the first day of the, the week, the original first day of the week. And I look it up, and sure enough, in my, you know, dictionary, because we didn't have, like, computers at the time. Um, you know, like I was like, yeah, she's right. You know, she Saturdays the used to be the last day of the week, uh, not the first day, the last day of the week. Um, and and yeah, like I I was just like, okay. And I guess that was like my my mom kind of like proving religion to me, really, <laughs> even though she never really gave me like theological arguments because you know now that I'm older, she I realized that she didn't uh, really know much about like theology or just had like the kind of like basic like this is what we believed for years now and the family it's a kind of like a familial kind of chain right it's a kind of a genealogy to it um so even my grandparents were seventh day adventist um however if i talk about my dad's side that's a whole nother story <laughs> but yeah 
can you can we can we go into the the the, the paternal side? Is there another religious lineage there, or is it agnosticism? Um, is it atheism? Yeah, I think my my dad's side. Well, I found out recently that my grandma, my dad's side, she's Catholic. Um, and I think everybody else seems to be somewhat, I guess, uh, irreligious or maybe Catholic and don't really talk about it. But my dad, I have explicitly asked my dad, and he goes, he's like his most basic theological principle is there's a God, but I'm not interested in anything else. <laughs> like, he's like, I'm not interested in organized religion. And he doesn't even really have like much concept after that. It's just, there's a God. And if you ask him anything else, he's like, yeah, I don't like, so I guess one maybe say quite, he's a theist, you know, maybe that would be the word, but he doesn't much go into anything else. Awesome. I mean, the first thing that's coming up for me is like this really interesting distinction that I've been thinking about since watching some um, basically, uh, I don't know how to word it, like people coming to religion online is maybe the best way to word it, like and like narrating their experience with religion online is like this, re this recognition that a lot of people who go to church or a lot of people who have built church and and religious life into their actual practical being don't necessarily know that much about theology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like and like like <laughs> just like I'm I'm going to church. Like my my granddad's uh, girlfriend uh, before he passed uh, would go to church, but she didn't have any opinion about Jesus, or she didn't have any opinion about theological denominations, and like just this distinction between sort of having let's say a rigorous theological understanding versus acting out the beliefs unconsciously mm -hmm. and i just wonder like what that brings up to you in relationship to sort of your mom in a way instantiating a religious ritual in your childhood but not knowing much about theology like what do you think about this distinction between let's say theological understanding and acting out mm -hmm. the belief system you know at first i thought like people need to know really people need to know what they're talking about um but then but then when we look back like for example like some scholars like de Nova talk about roman and greek religion well what i found very interesting about the use of priests and priestess is was they weren't the ones that had the knowledge of theology they were the ones that just knew the knowledge of the rituals which was very interesting and the layman's were kind of in the same position that you could say that my mom and my father are they don't really have much theology it was more of the apparently more of like the government state officials that had the theology apparently people that were the way up higher in the ladder that had more of the theology so it's it's really interesting that in general we still kind of have that same thing today <laughs> basically um and it does put into question like does everybody need to have a, a a more robust understanding i mean it seems like having technology and everything else seems to pave that way um but then there's another thing that happens where, which I think even Max Weber is correct about this, is that people are attracted to charisma. They're really attracted to charisma. Like you got the riz, you know, like dropping this term here. If you got the riz, then that's it, right? Jordan Peterson, all these other guys, they're formulating the theological conceptions for you, right? Like, this is what it is, man. Like, I think Max Weber was totally correct about, like, people, there's a certain notion of authority that is so valid, and it's charisma. <laughs> um, and it and it's so rampant, really. Uh, and so that we do, we definitely have a problem of, like, a new, like, a you know, our modern problem of, like, how do we deal with charismatic influence? and people's own conceptions of 
theology and everything else and, and so on. Like what is happening and what are the dangers of that, if there's dangers and, and so on. But I'll leave it to you. Yeah, I mean, that's something that that I've thought about and I thought about a lot, actually, because I often see theology and theological dynamics as mirroring or having some interesting metaphorical relationship to sexual dynamics in mm. the sense of like like I always talk about it in terms of um, sort of the behavior of proselytization like going up to someone and saying, hey, have you heard about this guy? <laughs> hey, have you heard about this book? Right? And get, come with me on Friday night. I, I've got a great little study group for you. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, there's not that much difference actually between, like there's not that much difference between the form of pickup artistry mm. and the form of proselytization. Like, I feel like it's mm. the same energy form. Yeah. Like, and, it, and it's like Riz. It's like, do you yeah. got the riz or do you not got the riz or whatever? And mm -hmm. and and then it makes me think also about whether or not this is unique to Protestantism, but yeah. like the form of charismatic Christianity, like mm -hmm. where the, the charisma of the leader at like the mega church sort of determines the belief system of the community or something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess like the the question the question in there is you know is is one's relationship with the theological or with god or the supernatural sort of structurally the same as one's relationship to to sexual energy and and the mm -hmm. the intimate other and mm -hmm. and even like going back to sort of like when I started the conversation and saying, where does the religious story begin for you? You said the mother, mm -hmm. like sort of like the child That's... with the mother. Mm -hmm. And anyway, we can get into like Freudian territory there. But <laughs> I mean, no, it was instant. It was instant association. When you said, I want to know where your, where your religion began. Mother was the first word that popped in my mind. I mean... And it was funny because I almost wanted to restrain from saying it too when I when it popped in my mind. I wanted to be like, "Yeah, my family," but really, really, my mother is one of the first, the first one that popped up. Um, and it's very Freudian in that case. Um, I think when I liked uh, Adam Phillips when he used this word, um, sex, the, the the sex part of it, the sex part of talking about it, you could say is is the feeling aliveness, is the aliveness of that conversation. Of when somebody says, you know, <laughs> like the pickup artist would be like, do you know the meaning of life or something like that? Like, you know, and, and somebody responds and it's like they want to pull you in in a sort of uh, intriguing way that you don't really get stopped at, like stopped that much before. Right. Because most people that stop you is kind of like, a, I just want to sell you something. But now they want to sell you something different. Right. It's like, I don't want to sell you something. I want to sell you an idea. And it's that idea that tries to be sold as really charismatic and sexy, right? Like, do you want to know the meaning of your life? Like that, that gets you really hard, you know, like knowing the meaning of your life. Um, <laughs> you could say that makes people alive. And even if they disagree with the idea, it makes you alive because it also brings out the aggressive violence of it too. Right. Um, so you're being sold an idea that you do or that you may or may not want. And I think what's very fascinating, I mean, it's true. We could think about whether it is really a Protestantism kind of thing. I would say maybe in America and in Europe, we would have succumbed to a little bit, little bit of the Protestant ideas and influence. Um, but it's really unclear. And I, I think that's kind of like what Max Weber was talking about, like the whole idea of like the Protestant work ethic, right? It sort of switched from it inverted the idolization of there's a God out there. I'm just going to do like do my thing. But instead it was like, no, your importance is here and now anything you do is the work of God. Um, so it made it very almost imminent um, in a way. And so it allowed the work process to be like, I'm doing God's work, <laughs> you know? So it, I, I do think there is, I, I do agree with him, I believe, that there is a chain of that as the causation um, and how we think. Of course, now, 
Protestantism, because it kind of questioned the, the primary authority, um, now there's a suspicion of authority. And this is why, I, I, this is precisely why I feel like charismatic figures are very attractive right now. Because there's a suspicion of authority and the only people that can really fill in that space, in my opinion, are charismatic people. That that's what it is, because if not, everything else is just like, are we really going to believe them? Like we had nobody charismatic for COVID. I'll just say that right there. Nobody was being charismatic about it. Nobody was. <laughs> Alex Jones. I forget. There were like a few like there was like oh, a yeah. few or like I, I was remembering. Actually, you know what it was that I was uh, no, I didn't get caught up into it. I was just like paying attention to the insanity of it was like the the Brian Rose, London Real, uh, David Icke thing. I don't know if you caught that, but like there were things like that going viral. Like it was like a case of, I, I saw it as like a case of psychosis, like stories about aliens and story, you know, stories about like who's really uh, trying to take over the world through COVID. And anyway, that's, that's, in, but you, but basically what sort of was attracting people to these things was a certain charismatic mm -hmm. um individual that was sort of um precisely occupying uh, this void like you're saying in the void of authority there's this charisma which 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 takes over which is um i guess quite dangerous in some sense i also um you know yeah like what you're saying about you know the the, the way protestantism immunitizing immunitizes the work ethic um our work is now god's work it's very powerful and i'm still thinking about how that might feed into the relationship between specifically protestant christianity and the emergence of capitalism i'm sure there was some relationship there um some like theopolitical loop there that was sort of priming the human population for a different type of socio-political order but let's 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 head back to let's head back to your story and i'd be interested to know about well let me frame it like this was there was there a rupture i'm, ass I'm assuming that I, I i guess i'll assume there was a rupture but was there a rupture between your familial upbringing mm -hmm. and starting to form your own conception or differentiate from the way in which you thought about theology as a child let's say mm. yeah i would say there's a rupture um but i would say for a long time i had a silent one um but it, it, it i couldn't make sense of what it was like i think really I, I think i just chose not to think about it that much really but when i was growing up you know, to me, it was like all these prohibitions, like just really didn't make me want religion at all. <laughs> and I think my mother saw that and she saw that it was happening with my brother and I actually. And she started throwing like bare minimums at us um, in terms of just like, you know what, you don't have to go to church. You don't even have to attend this stuff with me. Like if you just pray and have your like relationship with God, that's all I ask, basically. And like when she gave that promotion of it, I was like, cool. I mean, awesome. That that's that's basically that's nice because now it alleviates all the the have tos to just like I can just have my own relationship with God. And I think that's what my mother did, really. Like if it came down to it, she was willing to throw away all the prohibitions away and just be like, as long as you just have your relationship with God and you pray and you know it's it's your relationship now. So, you know, do what you will kind of thing. And I think that was a really her last attempt to like save religion for me. And in some sense, I think she did because, you know, obviously I don't, I don't feel ambivalent about it. I, you know, I, I mean, I have my hot takes about the way certain things are going in, in the theology world and everything, but for the most part, I don't hate religion, you know? So I, I would say she saved it for me in that sense. Um, <clears throat> but if I'm talking about the more, a salient rupture the more real one um the one that i noticed was when i joined the army actually um and i think the army really 
phrase a lot of things in perspective because one, I was away from home. And it's very interesting that I had this rupture as like a kind of away from my womb, my hometown. Um, and it was only when I was away from that kind of womb like city that I started questioning, like, I don't even know why I believe this stuff anyways. Like, I, I really do feel, I, I did really feel like I was just nominally Christian. The only thing that held on to the idea, like, I mean, just barely held on to it was the fact that I didn't know what, to, I didn't know how to deal with the, the after death part. <laughs> I was like, well, I would prefer to have an afterlife, so I'll just cling on a little bit longer. Um, but then after that, I, I think... Uh, it finally broke for me. And I was just like, well, you know what? I want to explore whatever this is. And so I got into Buddhism, Hinduism, you know, Taoism, other things. So there's there's two there's two ruptures there in some sense. Um, the first thing that came to my mind actually was the way in which your mother, or at least the way in which you, you framed sort of your mother's saving religion for you, it reminded me a lot like uh, the saying from Aleister Crowley, do what thou wilt. <laughs> like, <laughs> do, just do what thou wilt. <laughs> like, it's like, but like, I've been thinking about that a lot because Owen's really big into Aleister Crowley and we had some conversations about magic and Zagic and like trying to think about the relationship between Crowley and, and Christianity. Um, and, and there's a way in which in Crowley's work, I do see some connection to challenging or maybe even throwing away entirely a lot of the prohibitions mm -hmm. you know of, of christianity and sort of i'd be interested to know what prohibitions uh were you taking issue with in your more silent rupture faith well i mean i think it was just because i was a child and i just wanted to have fun i just wanted to watch i wanted to watch tv during saturdays which couldn't happen because it was supposed to be a rest rest day, a day of rest. And that was taken literally like, you know, like you do nothing. You just, it was just like pure leisure. But then I was like, but I, everything I want to leisure with, I can't do. <laughs> you know, I can't watch TV. I can't hang out with friends or whatever, because most of my friends would probably do that, right? Watch TV or, or go out to eat or something like that. And the seventh day Adventist idea was you don't make other people work on that day too. So even if they're working, um, you shouldn't contribute to them working, basically. And it's actually kind of strange enough that actually kind of it's very strange that it's almost like a capitalistic like take a break, <laughs> like have a rest. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah, that, that's those are the prohibitions that I, I I got hung up on, which is like, you know, I had to literally rest on Saturdays. Eventually, that started changing after I started growing older. But really, that was the main one. And the, the last contention that you know my mother and I had about anything was when I got tattoos. Um, but I just never cared about that one. I I just at that point I just was like, well, I mean, I think this is just the hill we're both gonna die on. So. <laughs> And, you know, and she's cool and we still have a good relationship. So, you know, yeah. And what was your what was your thoughts on the afterlife before the more the more violent rupture? What, did you sort of have a, a, a feeling of certainty? Um, I remember my when I was a kid, my my grandmother was a, on my father's side was a Mormon. And she mm -hmm. would always tell me, you know, well i'll see you in the afterlife and i i said uh i well, i didn't believe her and she would just say uh when you get there i'll say i told you so <laughs> you know so i always keep that in the back of my mind and i don't rule it out but yeah what was your relationship uh when you were younger to the idea of an afterlife i mean i i think i i mean i definitely found it comfortable but also frightening at the same time because that kind of idea came with a kind of um, activity, right? Kind of discipline of activity. Um, just like, well, I hope that I'm good enough to get in, <laughs> you know? So it was, it's, it's really fascinating to me, honestly, because I, I don't know what's worse. Um, I think even when I was a child, I didn't know what's, what was worse because 
afterlife is you get the certainty of it, right? You get the the nice certainty of it of that there's an afterlife. But then the haunting part is that's not guaranteed, right? At least it's sold to you as not guaranteed. And so it's terrifying. Like it's frightening to even think like, wow, um, even if there is one, I might still not even be able to get in it. Um, and then so it, it's just funny that, you know, when we think about the death part, like, oh, yeah, you just die and there's nothing else. That's also terrible, too. But it almost doesn't. I mean. I mean, it almost takes away like the. The half the a lot of the weight of just like I have to do something to get in. <laughs> death is for everyone baby you know what i mean like that is for everyone but apparently not heaven right so i think that that's a really interesting dynamic um that i never really thought about that much um but yeah at least that's how i was looking at it as a child it was just like yeah it's nice to have it but it's also frightening um and i think that's how i felt i've just been thinking about um how much more powerful that mechanism might have been in the pre-modern world that's kind of how I sort of came into sort of studying religion always from a more atheist perspective is that these types of sort of metaphysical beliefs are sort of hijacking some of our deepest insecurities and some of our deepest fears and sort of being used as a way to, um, I suppose, discipline and constrain people into a certain way of acting, which I think has a truth to it. I don't think it exhausts the question, um, mm -hmm. maybe as much as I used to, but um, I guess like what's coming up for me when you were talking about that feeling of the haunting feeling of the afterlife is this idea that's like more sociological, which is mm -hmm. a fundamental fear and pain that humans have of being excluded. And that when we're building groups or when we're building projects or when we're building activities, you can never include everyone. And almost by definition of doing something, I think even like the condition of doing something is that you have to accept that you have to exclude something to do something mm -hmm. because you can't do everything at once. And even like in a romantic partnership, like by definition, if you're with one person, you're excluding other people. And why did you pick that person? And who did you exclude? Mm -hmm. And why, you know, basically this idea of like confronting the reality of exclusion and I'm not sure if anything's coming up for you there. I can move on to a different topic, but I think it's no, an interesting yeah. thing about sociologically. No, every, it, it, something is coming up. Um, well, it's funny because I think this is why people have a hard time accepting like universalism, for example, because it poses even a bigger problem for them. It's much easier, I think, to say you have to do something to get in and it requires everyone to give a certain amount of effort, right? But then when you post like a kind of universalism, like everyone will get in or everyone will eventually get in, um, this really frightens people, I think, because it makes them have to grapple with another problem, which is, wait, well, how do I deal with the fact that I feel like this person doesn't even deserve it or shouldn't deserve it, right? So it's like, I, I think it's a much more visceral problem to deal with because it, it it's much easier to say you just weren't good enough and then move on with your life. It's much harder to accept the other one, which is everyone will be saved. And you're like, everyone will be saved? Like, <laughs> you know, that's like, that's like almost a lot of people's problem is like, everyone will be saved? Like, even the person that like treated me like crap, treated me like everything. It forces you to almost forget your entire history or have to look at uh, to look at it away almost, right? It's almost like saying deny my personal history or deny my trauma in some ways. Um, so that that's what prop that comes up to mind that really, even though that's a difficult thing to deal with too, the frightening part of, of that there's some qualifications to get into heaven. But it's even it seems to be even more frightening for other people that there there might be none. <laughs> it, it, you know what it's, it's, it's to me that's like really hitting on the Girardian scapegoat mechanism thing mm -hmm. that we we want someone to to scapegoat we want someone we want someone to be responsible for our pain or we want someone to 
I mean, I, 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 although I, so although I don't sort of hold these metaphysical beliefs necessarily, mm -hmm. I, I absolutely have contact with the affects of even that person gets in. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. that feeling, like that affect, I, I, I have a visceral contact with that. And that's, that's, that's the hardest, mm -hmm. like you're saying that there's nothing mm -hmm. harder than that. And, and mm -hmm. I feel like that's the that's like the last. But I, at the same time, I for, for me personally, I guess I'd ask you this question, because for me personally, my view is that even when I en encounter that affect, I try to be critical of my affect. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Because, I mean, it it's something we don't, really don't do often, but the affect is always the most visceral, but then also at the same time. We should be a little bit suspicious about our affects when it happens. Like, why do I feel so disgusted by this idea? Like, it's not immediately apparent when you start thinking about it. Why? Why would I have a problem with everyone getting saved? When the original first problem was, I just want to be saved. Well, now you are saved. But now it poses like the problem of the other for you, which is also very fascinating, right? Because... A kind of individualistic, we just you just need to save yourself, and it's not guaranteed whether you, that's a lot of personal frightening, but it doesn't. You don't have to grapple with the other in that too much. I mean, there is another in that idea because you obviously have to have a relationship with God, but it makes you have a more brutal relation with the other in universalism or universalistic takes about salvation, anyways, because you're like, well. <laughs> that <laughs> you know you're just like you start grunted and, and and you almost want to feel i to me when i first heard it it almost want, makes me want to feel like violence wants to emerge because it's like you want to say well you don't deserve it you like there's no way this you know so it's a very tempting affect to come out as like there's just no way everybody can get in there's no way i can't i can't imagine it <laughs> and tradi and traditionally speaking this seems to get like I've been reading a lot lately about 16th and 17th um, Christian wars in Europe uh, and, and, and studying the types of violence that erupts uh, in those wars. And it seems um, on some level absurd, but on some level kind of mirroring a little bit our times, not as extreme, but just very small distinctions leading to burning the other like very small distinctions and the other gets burned you know like mm -hmm. and, and and it seems like of course on a smaller level this is obviously we're not burning each other in the street but in some sense like there's i feel like a a digital there's like a digital like whether it's cancel culture or or just the appearance of scapegoating becoming sort of uh people becoming interested in that theory um there are these problems of how do I deal with these minimal distinctions that seem to bring me to face the brutality of the other um, and, and, and the reality of difference. Mm -hmm. mm. And, and, and then that triggers to me this very instinctual or very maybe not instinctual visceral desire to exclude um and mm -hmm. yeah i'm not sure where to go with that but just mm -hmm. i feel like that's that that i mean that that's that's where i feel like the real struggle like for me that's where the real struggle is it's not in i try not to worry too much about whether or not in the afterlife i continue or not yeah yeah um <clears throat> You know, what comes to mind is because my group has been reading, uh, we just finished up Kristeva's uh, The Need to Believe kind of book. Um, and there, there's been some things that were raised in that book. But basically, what for, the first thing that comes to my mind, I think, when we we're talking about Kristeva was this idea of we shouldn't be afraid of what other people believe. There's a really interesting thing, because if you think about so if you think about this literally, we shouldn't be afraid of what other people believe. If everybody did it too, that would actually mi mitigate a lot of the 
the paranoia, the violence, the the ideas of just like the fact that really we react because we're afraid of other people's beliefs as well. Um, because it's like, well, if they believe this, then how can how can we deal with my belief too, right? Um, and so Kriseva did did bring up this idea of that even the need to believe is way more pre-religious than than we have expected. It's a, it's a more pre-religious thing. Um, and it's also paired with the idea of the need to know. And I think I do think that's really fascinating that in some sense, when people decide to believe, it was because there was a sort of needing to know in there. And that needing to know, you could say, is more manifest with the idea of the afterlife. Well, I need to know how death is like. I, wa I want to know if there's after death or if there's anything else. I want to know if there's something beyond or more awesome than my immediate mundane work and whatever life. I need to know something that I need to know there's something more than that. And I think the need to believe is always really the, the the religious question of just like, well, what in some ways it's what kind of life would you like to live? Because what's immediately apparent to us is definitely not this one. <laughs> definitely not this one. So it, it brings the possibilities on the table of what's the kind of life you would like to live. And that's really seductive. And that's where the charisma comes in, because everybody else is coming in to tell you what kind of life you might want to live. Of course, it's never framed like that. It's in the form of prescriptions, right? Like you should live your life this way because here's where you have more meaning um, and more joy. But I do think the idea of being a, being not afraid of people's beliefs, I mean, I know it's not quite uh, analogous, but the fact that a, a child is allowed to believe in Santa Claus and the parents aren't afraid about this belief. And they almost even partake in it too they partake in that belief and i think i think there's a communal element to belief that it has not been acknowledged that you that you can find in the family and i think one example is that christian belief or not christian belief but the idea of believing in santa claus and how the parents let it happen and then the child kind of goes through his own discovery or despair about it eventually and the parents are there and the, the the parents have already fostered an environment so the child could move on, basically. Um, <clears throat> we don't really do that to each other as, as human beings. We don't like fostering any type of acknowledgement for belief. Like, it doesn't say that we have to believe what they believe in, but there's a certain part of acknowledgement holding on because really most of our beliefs, if we're, if we're being honest, reach dis disillusionment. The frightening part is, what are you going to do with that disillusionment? Um, and what might come after? Those are the really threatening parts about it, in my opinion. And I think a lot of people try to avoid that disillusionment as well. I really like the example you're using of Santa Claus because I'm sort of, uh, I actually have said a, a few times like um, that this was sort of like the, the, this was the primal scientific investigation for me and my brother growing up. Like we would like set up a video camera like on top of the fridge and like see who was really eating the cookies. And like like my parents like really like fed into the fantasy, you know, like they would even like put deer hooves on the front. Because uh, uh, well, I, I grew up in Canada, like there was actually snow on the, on the front of the That's lawn. Awesome. So they would put deer hooves and stuff like that. And they would try to create a scene basically. And like so I was yeah. like I was treating it like a crime scene investigation. <laughs> like, like what's going on here anyway but it is really like you're saying and and like I've then I've wondered like is is that the best way to raise children which is basically like as you're saying sort of purposefully setting up a transcendental illusion for it to be knocked down mm. like it it's like you're like that's the goal like we're setting up a transcendental illusion knowingly so that it can be investigated and knocked down and 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 sort of encounter this process of disillusionment um and there is something i think in the human being that requires setting up a transcendental illusion to overcome it um mm -hmm. and and like my favorite example of that now is like i feel like maybe maybe 50 years ago because everyone was 
for the most part in a sort of religious orientation or society with a religious background, you know, it would be transgressive to read Nietzsche, for example. Mm -hmm. But now I feel like we're, we're more in a secular atheist culture. Now it's transgressive to believe in Christ. Now, like reading St. Paul is transgressive or something like that. Like, it, but it's like, but like, no matter what it is, like there's some setting up of a transcendental illusion, whether it's Christianity or whether it's, let's say, liberal values. Like the, the illusion is liberal values now. We set up mm -hmm. that transcendental and then we have to knock it down with some, some other transgressive act. And, yeah, I mean, it's it's always shocking to me about the fact that we really, in some sense, this is like the Freudian point a little bit, that we're always a bit ambivalent about what we have. Um, and like, it's a, it's, it is fascinating because we, as much as we want the things, we also like want to destroy it. <laughs> you know, like, I, I feel like it's there. Like, um, I... Another way to look at disillusionment after belief is the fact that realizing that you had destroyed it a long time ago mm. without you really realizing it. It's just now you're realizing that you destroyed it. You've you've been destroyed. It. The disillusionment mm. is the understanding that you did this, <laughs> that you in some sense sucked the life out of a thing without knowing it. And then you're waking up to realizing that you did this. It's like understanding that you did the crime without even knowing that you were the one that did the crime. And so it's really fascinating that the disillusionment is so brutal because in some sense it's like, well, how did I not see this coming? You know, how did I, how did I, how did I, you know, because you have to really think about this. When we believe in something and hold true, it really is the most life effective force ever for us. It is what propels us, but there's another way to look at it. It's also the most, it was the most life denying force that we could have given something. Um, and then you really experience the brutality of when you become disillusioned. You know what I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about I'm thinking about the way I did that with my first girlfriend. Mm. Like with my first girlfriend, like I was like I was like brutally uh disillusioned for like it affected me for like maybe a year and a half or more. Mm. Like where I didn't date or like I wasn't like I was just reeling from it. But like if I really think about like the last months of our relationship, I did destroy it already. Mm -hmm. You know? So it's yeah. like yeah. and it's like, oh no, no, no. You know, there's something interesting there, you know? And and mm -hmm. and there is something to what you're saying too about it's what propels us and it's also a life denying force at the same time. Because yeah. I feel like if I stayed in that relationship, there's a huge denial of life that was going on there. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, like the key to my motivation is there. So I don't know how to fully word what's going on there, but mm -hmm. there's something about maybe discovering the paradoxes of our motivation Mm -hmm. that, that's set up in this weird setting up an illusion to destroy it type of thing, which mm -hmm. I think even if we're atheists, even if we're secular atheists, even if we're not religious in a conventional sense, certainly we experience that in sexual relationships. Mm -hmm. Not sure what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, an atheist still believes to whatever degree they may not believe in God or whatever, but they believe in something. They believe in something. And it's always usually, at least atheist conversations are always paired with like autonomy, like, yes, I can have a morality without God. Like those are ways of believing, you could say, that they, they hold true. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the real part about sex, I think it's really fascinating, is the fact that we all believe we have to talk about sex in a good way. <laughs> like, that's actually what's really fascinating to me because I, I do believe that there's a part of sex that we really hate. And I think the part about sex that we really hate is what everybody else thinks about sex <laughs> and how it should be done. Could you could you um, go into could you go into that? What 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 do you mean by that? Because I think I know oh, what you mean. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, like for example, like I because I watch a lot of like a lot of pop culture things on my YouTube and 
it's like um you know discrepancy between like really far right like podcasts and then like um really like really liberating sex autonomy kind of side too so i'm like watching both of these but it's like very interesting but anyways so what i see a lot of in these conversations is the fact that um like for example a woman will complain about not having an orgasm for example right and she would be like i don't want to date a man that doesn't give me an orgasm um and what i hear from that is i just want my partner to care about my pleasure right which is a which is a real problem in some sense because it's like if you don't care about my pleasure then i can't get myself off um <clears throat> and so when we talk about this this idea of like i want you to care about my pleasure there's something else that's not being admitted it's also the fact of i hate sex because i have to depend on somebody else for my pleasure nobody talks about that but it it's all it's always in the in the vein of i i didn't have my orgasm i didn't have it right but What's not admitted is the fact that in some ways we hate sex because we were so dependent on the other person giving a, doing the pleasure for us. And that, that has to strike some ambivalent feelings about things because it's like, I'm depending on you to give me my utmost pleasure. And what's also frustrating about sex is, well, you could just do it yourself. So why wouldn't you just do it yourself? But the thing is, nobody wants to. Nobody really, no one would prefer to do it themselves. Why would you? You're supposed to love sex. And when, if, when you love sex, you make the partner do it for you. And so I think that's the ambivalent part about it. People don't really talk about that, really. About how it's so painful and frustrating to have to depend on somebody else for your pleasure. I actually, that's that's reminding me actually of, a conversation I had with my granddad after the breakup with my first girlfriend, which was something like, well, I, I can't depend on the other, but I can depend on my own work drive. Mm -hmm. Meaning like I just put all of that energy, like basically because it was too, it, it was too anxiety provoking, I suppose, or too painful to depend on the other that at least I could put it into work because that's just my responsibility. And I think a lot of people do that. They might become workaholics mm -hmm. because they don't want to um, deal with the, the things you're talking about, about the other. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, those dynamics are, are, you know, the other thing I would frame in, an interesting sort of question with dependence and the other is this idea that, which I think is primarily a Lacanian idea, which is that when we're born into the world, we're born completely impotent and we're born in a way that we're completely dependent on the other. Mm -hmm. And so we have to re-experience. And that's the weird thing is that at the same time is that I think a lot of our sexual fantasies are fantasies of power, like mm -hmm. fantasies of like the greatest sexual jouissance and, or something like that, or that like I'm the sort of man or, or I'm the woman or whatever. That at the same time, we have to confront this primal dependence on the other. And maybe that's mm -hmm. why we don't talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it really is like the most ambivalent part about sex, in my opinion. But no, like, and, and rarely people admit it. Like, it's really striking to me that we've, Freud broke down the idea, our ideas about sex, right? Um, he kind of brought in the, the scope of it. You know, it's it's pleasurable to eat. It's pleasurable to, you know, do other things. It's pleasurable to talk. Like there's so much modes of pleasure that he really broadened our idea of, of what sex is or what sex is actually like. Um, but the thing that is not talked about in, in, in now is that even though we've all kind of accepted more a sexual liberation, it's funny that it is almost paired with talking about how good sex is or how good I want sex to be to be um or how i like my sex but to me that's all very manifest enjoyments of talking about how they also hate hate sex because they have to talk about how much they're dependent on <laughs> you know do you think do you think how, how would you how would you situate your 
because that so for me like when you say i watch uh sort of far right content versus liberating sex autonomy content it's like i would say like it, what what i've seen is like so like like daily wire versus mm -hmm. fresh and fit <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> something like that but like there's all these weird you know paradoxes in in sort of both extremes mm -hmm. um sort of about yeah they say i guess that like maybe it's more obvious in the fresh and fit side about actually hating sex because they're so openly talking about it and they're so sort of wrestling with the sort of primary antagonisms there whereas on the daily wire side there's just sort of like these absolute prohibitions and very clear roles which work absolutely or something like that yeah well what's interesting like when you talk when you hear a lot of the conservative like talk on like podcasts and stuff with like more liberal women um the threat of the orgasm is just like well you know biology doesn't demand that you have an or orgasm whatever right which actually is funny because like i think my female friend just she always hated hearing that line so she told me she was actually that's not true recent study says that a woman, a woman having orgasm makes it more receptive to 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 the sperm, or whatever. Um, but anyways, the the main conservative argument is always centered on the fact that really sex is just not that important. It's just mainly it has a function to it. It's not about your pleasure. It's about a function. But to me, that's another way of saying I don't like sex, so I'd rather reduce it to a function because it would it would remind me that I have to please the other person. You know, it would remind me how impotent I am. So it's it's trying to reverse the impotence by saying, no, it just has this function and that's it. We find our meaning in children and family. That's the main point of sex. That's all it is. And like, I'm like, no, I. it's very clearly not. <laughs> it's very clearly not because you see on the, the sexual liberation side, it's like all about my, it's all about pleasure. It's not necessarily hedonistic, but it can be, but it's a lot about pleasure and like what they would like and what they would not like. And of course, there's some downfalls to that because what the, the conservative is going to say, well, how do you have meaning? How do you have purpose, fulfillment and so on? So it's always a threat between two types, two type of archetypes of, of like symbolism, meaning on the one hand, which is the more conservative side, meaning and fulfillment. And then the liberal side is freedom. The fact that I'm capable of doing it. And it's always, it's almost as if they're mutually exclusive from each other. Like they're always talking about it as if they are, um, which is a very interesting thing that I've noticed when I'm watching like these clips and videos. You know, it, one of the weird paradoxes to me that I always try to think is like the paradox that actually Darwin's, Darwinian conception of sexuality is actually quite conservative because it's sort of reducing sexuality to its reproductive function. Whereas with Freud, I think what opens up with Freud is what you're pointing out is that, no, it's not just reducible to the reproductive function, but it's actually associated with pleasure and enjoyment. And, mm -hmm. and actually, it's actually a pleasure and an enjoyment that actually doesn't have anything to do with reproduction. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, yeah. this problem sort of opens up in a big way. And I think like what you're framing here, these two archetypes of meaning and freedom, also interesting is like, that I think on the more liberal side versus the conservative side is like conservatives are like meaning will guarantee our happiness. Whereas the liberal side is like, it's about freedom and it's about freedom independent of happiness. It's about freedom. Even if you're unhappy with your freedom, it's still about freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then also sort of pushing into the pleasure you push into sort of the extremes of jouissance and the death drive. And it's like sort of confronting let's say the the limit of your being and i feel like the conservative um argument is to defend against confronting it's like the family defends against the death drive <laughs> yeah or something like that <laughs> or something like that um which which you know which i'd imagine is actually paradoxically related to creativity because i know that like for example the needle dropper anthony fantano he'll always say that um conservatives can't produce good music <laughs> I don't know if that's actually true, but like, yeah, I don't know if that's actually true, but yeah, I could, I could definitely see it.
Anyway, well, let's 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 go back to let's go back to your story with the army rupture, because that's sort of where we get the rupture from, sort of the family home, like you say, sort of away from the womb and away from sort of the starting condition with the mother, and it's I if I remember correctly, it's sort of where you started talking about challenging your concept of the afterlife and exploring other religions, and it would be interesting to know what the connection was between sort of the deconstruction of the afterlife fantasy and exploring other religions um because it, my understanding is that really to be a christian is at least how i understand traditional christianity is that it's it's very much linked to the afterlife fantasy and if that falls then everything falls yeah <clears throat> i mean yeah i would say traditional i mean i know there's other forms of theology that are trying to have one without a guarantee, like in a different way, or less concern about the afterlife anyways. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, when when it ruptured for me, um, I suddenly become very fascinated about other religions. Um, and I, it's funny that I say fascinated because it reminds me of what I just read from Adam Phillips' book on Promises, Promises. And he says, fascination has to deal with loss. And he says, Freud, Freud acknowledged this, but that fascination is usually a result from loss. Um, and so I became deeply fascinated about Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism. But when I got into, and I really got into Buddhism for a while, and what I started noticing was, um, I, was I started growing more and more okay with not having a kind of afterlife that I originally imagined. Um, suddenly it became about more this unspeakable thing in Buddhism, right? Like this idea of enlightenment and, and so on. Um, and I was really obsessed with that. But then something else happened where I was like, you know, and, and this is the part that's really interesting to me about my experience, is that there's just nothing wrong with Buddhism for me. I was just perfectly fine. But then something kept dogging on me and it was like, and it felt like there was something wrong and I couldn't, and I couldn't, I didn't have the words for about what I felt wrong or what I felt missing in Buddhism. Um, and then that's when I fell into Islam and I became Muslim for a bit. Um, which is really fascinating because when people talk about trauma, they talk about how you have to, in order to live with trauma, you have to talk about your story in a little bit of a different way so you can live with it. You have to do a bit of a translation for it and be able to live with it. But if the story is too close, then it's really traumatic. But what I find really interesting about Islam was that in some sense, Islam was the different enough story, but not too different enough story for me to be able to accept fully. Right, because Islam and Christianity, there's some similarities, but it's also there's a lot of differences. Um, so I, I do find it very striking that I settled for a similar but different story versus a completely different one. And I and I and I do think that has I, I don't know how it would relate, but I do think it would relate to trauma itself in some ways that I was looking for a different story. I wanted a different story, but I didn't want too much of a different story. Um, so it, it might have a hint to, you know, having w whatever it was that I, I needed to believe. So I still ended up believing in afterlife, but it was a different one. <laughs> you know? um, and then, there's, yeah. a, there's a few themes I wanted to, to bring up there before going too deep into Islam. The, the first one is the fascination and the loss angle, because I think that's really interesting to think about. Um, and I'm just thinking about the things that fascinate me. Mm -hmm. Like, what what am I fascinated by? And is it connected to loss? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, I could be fascinated with um, certain sports or athletes. And is that connected to the loss of that fantasy of being that myself? Mm. For example, Um and then the other thing that I think is interesting is, and because I've always thought this is interesting about your story, because I knew about your transition to Buddhism to Islam, but like what always fascinated me about your your 
your complaining about Buddhism is that there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> yeah. that that, like that's hilarious. And it's just like, I wanted to connect that with like, that we like, here's my first idea is like, we want tension. Mm -hmm. And like, maybe Buddhism's too perfect in that regard. Like, I don't know. That's, 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 that's an idea. Yeah. I mean, it, it's there. I mean, you know, sometimes I have to question my, my, my own affects again, because I think recently, you know, I was having a conversation with my partner and I was feeling like I started getting the same idea about Buddhism. Like, I feel like there's something wrong. But then my, 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 my friend told me, she said, uh, this was very brilliant. She goes, you know, sometimes you, you might be afraid of something else. And I said, what would I possibly be afraid of? And she goes, you might be afraid to be happy. <laughs> right. So there is, there is this, you know, it's not really sure. I mean, I, maybe with Buddhism, it was true. I was maybe suffering the same thing of like, I was afraid to be happy, but also I think there is a tension that's necessary because it's like, if I didn't have that tension, I wouldn't be able to formulate what's going on. Like, it really is daunting to have no tension. Like, if you really think about it, like, you know, and, and of course, some people talk about like, oh, well, this is really more like the, the, the kind of anxiety and paranoia of people that are traumatized. But I don't think so. I, I think there's proof enough to say that when there isn't any tension, you start having fantasies or you start ha or like the tension starts emerging anyways <laughs> because it's like it's so tempting you're like I, I i'm not sure if i can just deal with having a, a tensionless relationship to something you know like i know there has to be something wrong <laughs> you know like you know like maybe this is the neurotic part of ourselves like I, there has to be something wrong <laughs> go ahead I don't know. Forces exploring the foundation of modern philosophy, as well as live events bringing philosophy to life. Visit philosophyportal.online and become a member today. Throughout 2024, our members get access to four monthly events, and also access to all historical recordings from our previous private events, including events with Lehman Pascal, Alenka Zupancic, Elliot Rosenstock, Carl Hayden Smith, David McCarricker, Alex Ebert, Andrew Davis, Ruth Kastner, and Matthew Segal. Find out more at philosophyportal.online. Go ahead. I don't know if I'll be able to get it off completely in terms of like the metaphysical point I wanted to make, but I want to maybe more bring it to like that really intimate feeling of going into the tension in a sort of way in which you seem to like, where I, I seem to be um, unable to stop self-sabotaging myself. Like, like that the feeling that I, the, the, the feeling that I have with that is most intimate probably with my, um, with my diet and my eating routines and my eating patterns, because I can get like, I, like there was a certain moment where I thought I had, conquered it or there was a certain moment where I thought I had mastered it meaning that I had gotten really good at fasting um to the point where like I you know I was kind of like at the body weight that I had as an ideal and like you know I I had avoided all of my sort of binge food eating habits that that I had uh sort of accumulated in my teenage years um, and then like a really weird feeling came over me in a meditation, which was like missing my symptom. Mm -hmm. Like I missed the symptom and like, I was like tensionless and like, and then, and then I've had like that feeling return and return again. Like even last night I had it where like, I was just meditating. Um, I don't know, like nine and 10 PM. And like, I was feeling like happy. And I was just like happy. I'm like, there's nothing wrong. Like I'm really like kind of in the, you know, with my body. But then there's like this little pestering voice, which says, I'll oh, just go fuck it up. <laughs> you know, I just go fuck yeah. it up. Yeah. You know, I don't... Absolutely. <laughs> it happens all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's like so unescapable. And I think I think I've accepted over a while, long period of time, just like, you know, um, I think it's more of a 
instead of eradicating it, it's more like, I just want to live with it somehow. I just want a better way of living with it versus like completely getting rid of it. And it's, it reminds me of a similar conversation I had with my partner where I was like, well, you know, what I don't want to have is to be, for us to be completely conflict aversive. Also because I, because what always leads to conflict aversive relationships is there's an explosion at the end. There's a rupture. And it's really, it's really traumatic when it happens. I was like, what I'd rather have is us just having the more daily battles of whatever things that are happening versus a sort of silent conflict aversive relationship. I was like, I really don't want to have that sort of conflict aversion. So um, there's, there's definitely a juggling act, which is uh, very frustrating to have, but also like, I see no way out of it. It, it does seem to be a juggling act at, at every point in time. <laughs> Yeah, and I guess that's I guess that's what I guess that's what happens when you go into extreme aestheticism. Um, is that there's an ex like you're just well, it's like I get maybe it's like a return of the repress. Mm. It's like like if you just if you're completely conflict averse, or if you're completely into fasting, or you completely sort of whatever it is you know doing sort of like abstinence or whatever like that there's going to be like a return of the repressed because what you're basically doing is is that you're you're shutting down the life drive and you don't want to reconcile the fact that being with the life drive is to be with the constant tension mm -hmm. and that maybe the best sort of ethical path is to deal with sort of the um to accept that tension and 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 that 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 just the best translation of that is maybe accepting the daily battles. And th th there's a, like, there's a part of me that's like, like that, that, that is always wrestling with like the eternity of the daily battle. Yeah. It's just an eternity. <laughs> Have you heard of Z Zizek's uh, joke about, um, he talks about the yogis, you know, like they're uh, like abstaining from sex and like all the, the crazy things they do. And he goes in, he goes, and what's really funny about that is they still get erections. <laughs> he goes, like, they can't they can't stop that. Like, that's the one thing you can't do. You can't stop from having an erection. You can you can deny yourself everything, but you can't deny yourself from having an erection. And it's, like, so funny that that's the one thing that, you know, as, as males, it's, like, it's, it's really, like, beyond our control. Like, you know, you just get an erection from waking up or, or what, whatever it may be. Um, and it just happens, and it really shows you, like, yeah, sure, you can. Yeah, well, what will power? <laughs> what, what will power? <laughs> you yeah. know, what will power? Your erection yeah. says, what will power do you actually have? <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely right. It just reminds me of David McCarrick. David McCarrick was recently on a, a sublation media, and he was said he was apparently when Doug Lane first met David, he was going through like a, I don't know, like a gender identity crisis of some kind. And then he would like basically asked him straight up is like, do you still identify as a man? And then David McGarrick said, um, well, I, I struggle with I, I, I have the same struggles as everyone who's been born in the body with a penis. Like that's like that's where I get my male identification is like I struggle with having a penis. That's 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 my starting point. Um, and, and maybe that that does bring us from Buddhism to Islam, actually, because like one of the things that I've often and even like the difference between Buddhism and, and maybe even the yogis. Or Buddhism, you know, Buddhism and the yogis, Buddhism and, and the Abrahamic traditions is that I've always thought about the Buddhist metaphysics as lending itself to a type of almost castration, like even like like we sh we shave our heads you know, like if you think about the monks, you know, they don't have any any hair, you know, they, they, they're very minimalist, like getting rid of everything, um, sort of trying to be minimalist with with lifestyle and like imprint on the planet and like, you know, appetite and even speaking like even we don't like we, we, we we're silent. You know, there's this privilege to silence. Um, and I sort of all, always seen that as kind of like, um, some negation or castration of the phallus of some, of some way. And then, 
you know, where I see Islam and this is where I'll get your point of view on this is like, do you see like I, I see that as like, like I had a conversation with Jacob Kashir where he was attracted to Islam at one point and he was what his attraction was to it was it was very masculine. And he saw it as like a masculine form, which was sort of maybe um, appealing in the context of a Western culture, which didn't know what to do with its own masculine identity. So I don't know, I'm just throwing a lot out there, but like, I'd love to see what sort of hits and what doesn't for you there. Yeah, well, I like the first comment on the Buddhism thing, because I thought it was really interesting. It's it's almost like the the way he said it almost made me think like they've made what they're what they're actually saying what Buddhism actually saying is castration is pleasurable. Like there, you can find pleasure in castration, which is very odd, but it's super paradoxical for me to make me believe in it enough to say like I think that's what Buddhism is saying because in some sense Buddhism is also threatening the castration of the fact that your pleasure is never going to be enough anyways. So you might as well just cut yourself off ahead of time, right? Like, what's the point of having all these desires when you're going to get cut off from them anyways? They're going to disappoint you. They're never going to satisfy you. You might as well enjoy the castration. And I wonder if that's actually what it's saying. Enjoy the castration versus um, enjoy your pleasure. But it, it, it inverts it. It's like enjoy your castration is saying enjoy your pleasure. Enjoy the fact that you're going to be castrated. Um, and I and I wonder if there's you know a lot of significant things to talk about with that. Um, but yeah, Islam is is uh interesting. Um, because in some sense it's it is patriarchal, you could say, um, but it's also in some sense has a father that doesn't exist. Like in the Christian setting, it's the whole Jesus, you know, saying that, you know, if you love me, you love me to the father, whatever, you know, like there's a connection between Jesus and the father. Too. There's no mediation, really. Um, the only mediation that you could argue for is Muhammad. Um, and 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 that's about it. But other than that, it, it doesn't seem to have the same sentiment of like, if you, you know, know me you know me you know to the father it's more like it, it's more action based right like you want to mimic the behaviors of muhammad um to to be in contact with the father and and i don't know if there's a certain i mean of course people also say be like jesus um, which makes this comparison a little bit more difficult but i do think i'm not even sure if it necessarily promises that you would know the father in this case well, what's right. the? It seems to me like what's the difference between Christ and Muhammad in this in this equation in regards to mediation with God? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is the question. That is the question because also Jesus is God, right? So you you know like I think that's the the problem with some of the mediation is just like you can have a God that you can relate with in some ways, and it makes it more personable. But then Muhammad, um, and it's funny because I've heard of some converts that were Muslim and they went to Christianity. And one of the things I was questioned when the Muslim was asking them was, why did you switch? And he goes, well, um, I don't know. I just found it a more attractive story. Like I, I, I found myself wanting to believe in a more sentimental story that Jesus died for our sins and, and so on. And it was a lot about love and self-sacrifice. Um. In Islam, there's stories like that because it, it, it depends on what kind of Islam you're talking about. Um, like Shia Islam has like a very powerful story with the, you know, their two originators, like Ali and the, I forget the other woman's name, Fatima. Um, there's definitely a love sacrifice story in there, and it's very romantic for the, the Shia people. Um, so it's very difficult to talk about Islam because they don't seem to have like a such universal story for all of them versus it seems like no matter what Christianity you're talking about, um, there's a love sacrifice story to it. And it's very sentimental. I can't really recall a universal sentimental story in Islam for all of them. Because they would all disagree about what it was. 
Now, perhaps the most sentimental story could be the one where, you know, Muhammad dies and, and, and so on. Maybe it might be good to look at that. But maybe some of the problems with Islam is that there is no, it, it's, I don't want to say there's no place for a woman because definitely Fatima and uh, Elisha are in there. Um, but they don't seem to play the role of giving birth to God like Mary does, which would be interesting to explore that. Um, but my only guess about Islam and its sort of differences is that it's really unclear to me about what it's really, I think what I struggled with, with was it's really unclear where you stand or, or whatever that may be. Like, it always seems to talk more about law and prohibition. And it's always felt as more like you're dealing with a more invisible father than a than a father that you can have some type of personal relationship with. Um, of course, that can be mitigated by Sufism. Sufism would would mitigate a lot of those problems. Um, but the but the issue is people don't. Um, Sufism is looked as like very heretic. So um, it's fascinating to me that there's prohibitions without a father but under the name of the father kind of thing. <laughs> could you could you say a little bit more about the invisibility of God in in in, in Islam cuz that's or the the invisible father in Islam because yeah, I mean what's your understanding of that? Um I just I don't know well, much about it. Well, my understanding of like the invisible father is just the fact that it's a pure oneness to it. It's the it's the whole concept of like tahid, like unity, oneness. It's it's a very pure, pure monotheism. It's, there is, it, it, there's a father, but you can't see the father. It's not a tangible thing. And so in some ways, to me, I look at very paradoxically where it's like, there's a father, but then there's also like, but you don't know who the father is. You just know that it's prohibited. You know, it's, it's prohibited. That's it. And so it's like a very, it's a very like impersonal way of saying, after the father's dead, of saying, no, dad wouldn't want that. Dad wouldn't want you to do that. Um, so it's really weird. You know, it's it's a, it's a really weird thing. And of course, there might be some, I, I have to think about how it actually, you know, like Judaism's difference. Because Judaism almost has like a similar thing, because they don't have Jesus either as a sort of mediation. But they also have like this concept of like the covenant and and and, and the communal people. So... Uh, and the promise. So I would say Islam is, you know, I think if we really want to think about the differences, we have to think about what's the difference between Judaism and Islam with their invisible fathers and then think that in relation to Christianity. Um, but yeah, those are the thoughts that are coming up. I guess what I'm thinking about is... Actually, something weirdly enough that I, I heard Jonathan Pajot saying about God and, and Christianity and the representation of the father is that I think his understanding was something like Jesus solves the problem of representing the father and that when when he from his point of view, when he sees forms of Christianity depicting the father, he sees that as the degeneration of the form. Like, and I'm just trying to connect that with what you're saying about the invisible father as this pure oneness and like this pure monotheism where you don't know who the father is. Because it's like what Pajot is saying, when you see an image of like the old man in the clouds, like if you just Google Christian God or Christian father and you see the old man in the clouds, Pajot says that's a degenerative form that that actually the purest or the truest forms of christianity they just represent god through jesus mm. something like that so like mm. you but then but then you get that mediation mm. whereas it seems like that link is less obvious in judaism and and islam i have another question but if there's anything that's coming up for you there i'd be interested but there is another question connected okay yeah go ahead Okay, so my 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 question is more about your path and sort of like the interesting dimension of of what I see in your path in relationship to sort of the path I've walked, which is 
that whenever I entertain religion or whenever I entertain theology, I always do it as it were from the outside. Like, it's not like I have no contact with the inside of say Christianity. There are moments where I've had contact with the inside of Christianity, but I'm always sort of like, like I'm interested in like analyzing theology and religion, but I'm, I'm, I'm less familiar with being on the inside of a religion. And I'd just be mm. interested in terms of your story when you're, you know, and, and that might be because I was raised secular also, like, because mm. I was raised secular, like I, I, I didn't, I wasn't ever on the, in, like the inside for me was, I guess, secularity <laughs> mm -hmm. in some sense. So, you know, when you're inside Buddhism or when you're inside Islam, um, yeah, what's that like? How does that change your experience? Well, I mean, it, it it changes the experience because it for me, it kind of moves the abstract to the concrete. Meaning like a lot of these Muslims are just normal people. Like really, they are. They were just really normal people that just believe in different things. But even if they believe in different things, their variation or their intensity of their belief is very fluctuant. Like it, it's, you know, you could meet a Muslim that's like kind of like, eh, you know, like, yeah, I do this and like I go to mosque and I do Ramadan or whatever. But like for him, it's still not that serious. Like it's just like it's just it's just a way of living, just a way of being. Um, And I think what was difficult for me when I was inside was just like I had a really hard time not being the, the, the perfect one, <laughs> the perfect Muslim. Right. Whereas like all the other people were just like, I mean, you definitely had your your types, you know, like. There would be the more very serious Muslims that took everything seriously, literally, um, maybe a little bit too far. Um, and then there's just more like your layman kind of like Muslims that were just like, yeah, I mean, I don't really go off to a mosque, but I, go, I show up for Ramadan. You know, like very normal people, really. Just like normal Christians would have variations in their own beliefs and varying intensities about it. What that showed me was that, really, I don't even know what I'm getting into. <laughs> I don't really know what I'm getting into because in some sense, it just made me realize that it almost comes down to the same trope. Like you're just looking for community in some ways. Because it's like, even though that belief is important, it's really hard to have that belief without the community in some ways. Um. And I think I, I left Islam, really, and I, and I don't have any ambivalence towards it, um, is that I left it because really it was just really hard to be, be in it. It was hard to be in it. And the reason why it was hard to be in it, in it, it was not because of religion itself, per se, um, but more like the cultural disguises that present itself as sort of religious ideas. Um, and that's also very hard to discern as well when we talk about Islam. But, you know, for example, like in the West, um, women look at the, the way other women don on the um, hijab as sort of like a form of oppression. Well, it can be, but that's not the original signification. The original si signification was that a woman was pious or announcing that she was pious to God himself. What's become oppressive about it, you could say, is that men belittle, beat up, or threaten women that don't wear the hijab. Now, I can it's very understandable to come to that conclusion of hijab would be the symbol of oppression because that's what they see. That's what the men are doing. But the symbolic itself of, of the hijab has another signification, which was a woman's piety. And so in some sense, when we're talking about a woman's independence, what she wants is for you just to mind your business about um, her relationship with her hijab, basically her relationship with God. And whether or not she's wearing the hijab or not, she still feels a sense of like, this is my own relationship with God. And it could be one of struggle, which is why maybe, they, maybe why they don't wear hijab. It could be one of struggle. Or it just could be that they also feel a little different, like they feel like it's okay. They can still have one without one. Um, so there's many ways to look at it as forms of oppression, but also forms of expressing their own singularity about their relationship with God. Um, 
so it's it's very difficult to talk about it's it can be difficult to talk about it from the outside because we may be missing the the important symbolisms and how the significations change with like a symbol like the hijab it can be oppressive but it can also be liberating for them but yeah I'm gonna look, let's see what pops up for you Kado. well i do like the topic of um that you're bringing up with women in the hijab but but the main thing that i'm interested in talking to you about specifically is what you said earlier about it's hard to have the belief without the community yeah and the relationship between the belief and the community and i feel like that you know and and that just seems to be such a meme right now is like you know, the community that you just just how do we relate to, to to community and belief? And like the way I've always thought about it is that the human being evolutionarily, historically, has been absolutely tied to the community in such a way as that we could have never escaped the community in some sense because you're just a tribal being. Like and that goes back to the beginning of our existence as a species. And then that sort of what's been achieved throughout history and perhaps really intensely in modernity is the conditions of possibility for progressive individualism, that we have more and more capacity to recognize singularity. Um, and in some sense, there's something of that process, which you could say is a process of like profanation or you know the emergence of the profane and the pro the emergence of the secular it just sort of <clears throat> i guess i'm asking in your oscillations in and out of different religious traditions does it come down to the fact that the belief in a certain communal structure doesn't really hold you totally that you kind of break out of it, like it, like that. There's, like it's non-all. Like the mm. belief of the community might sort of propose itself to the individual as all, as total, but that this sort of falls apart under its own sort of investigation, sort of like how you were describing your experience with Christianity as a child, almost. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the one thing to to what I noticed is that. What the community sells is that there's a perfect belief in something. Okay. What you realize when you're interacting with people is that all their beliefs are imperfect. So this is, and this is really fascinating because what it really reveals is that the, the perfect belief is really unattainable. Nobody has the perfect belief. Everybody has varying degrees of accepting it, not accepting it. Um, a little bit of ambivalence, reluctance, resentment, whatever it may be, they all vary across the board. And so what really would feel is that not only is, you could say, not only is our beliefs imperfect, um, but also the community itself is imperfect, but the community doesn't want to sell itself as imperfect. It never wants to sell itself as imperfect. It wants to sell it as the the place like you're talking about it wants to say it as the all it wants to say it's the all but it's very clear that it's not and a lot of us deny that a lot of us deny that it's not like a lot of us deny this not and it's because of the ambivalence with our own beliefs it's really because of that we have certain gripes certain little disagreements about the way we believe or how strong we believe or how less we believe and and it's because it's hard being in a community where you're still dealing with basically other variations of belief. Even though we believe in the same thing, you're still like, it's very shocking to see a Christian or a Muslim and, and be like, oh, I didn't see you go to church today. Like, what's going on? Are you having doubts? You know, like it we we don't we don't like accepting imperfections, imperfections in our belief. And we try to use the community as a crutch for that. But also you start realizing that the whole community consists of that imperfect beliefs, a series of them. 
like my whole view is like we need to accept of course like my whole view is like it's kind of like a, a, a community of the negative in the sense that we sort of accept the the incompleteness and the imperfection as what is most beautiful but in order to do that you constantly have to transform your own relationship with negative affects in relationship to the other and i feel like that is sort of imminent in some sense because at least for me like like the real philosophical problems of belief for me are not related to the afterlife because i don't struggle with that like i don't personally have any struggle with that specifically it's much more about like these little differences with the other's belief. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, you know, what's coming through in your transmission to me is like the whole belief in the afterlife with the community that's all is a total obfuscation of the real problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so maybe that is, uh, uh, this, this transitions to, for me, this transitions to maybe getting closer to where you are now in some sense because I, I i know you've well maybe i can just frame it like that since yeah. transitioning out of islam where have you found yourself um and where do you find yourself now well i think <clears throat> i'm still you know sometimes i'm still very tempted to go back into a, an organized religion um but i also think um I realize that really I'm just never really going to be satisfied with that because I'm so aware of the imperfections that are really apparent in the community. What frustrates me is how they deny it, how the community denies. They try to sell it off as like, we're nice, perfect, whole community. We can help you and so on. But really you start discovering that all those people themselves also struggle. Um, but the thing is, they can't admit it to themselves, so they want to help you overcome your own doubts and so on. At least this is more the Christian, you know, Protestant Christian kind of thing, and maybe Catholicism too. Um, but I would say I've had my inter interactions with Islam. Um, but the one thing that I've I've w wanted to accept more and more is that seeking itself is a kind of religious experience. Um, and I believe like a, a Famous musician said that. I really forgot his name. Um, but seeking is a form of religious experience. And I really do believe that. I really do believe that seeking is a form of religious experience. Um, and yeah, I, I don't, I, I'm not as tempted to, to go back into a sort of organized religious format. But I also really don't care about labeling myself as spiritual, but not religious or whatever, because I have no ambivalence about religion. Um, the only thing is, is just like, you know, what frustrates me is really the just sort of the obscurity of the imperfections. Um, and I'm not sure if I can really feel comfortable being in an environment that people are obscuring the imperfections. Um, and that's why I said like, because it's a way of saying like, I'm afraid of your belief. <laughs> it's a way of saying I'm, I'm really afraid of your belief. So I'd rather not hear that. Um, and and my partner has also gone through the same kind of disillusionment about her own Christianity um, and so on. So we're both in a kind of like, you could say maybe like abyss or lost or whatever. I, I don't know what I would label these outside kind of non-names for, you know, not willing to conform either to a kind of spiritual but religious sentiment or I'm just full on organized religion. Like I think there is a, sort of middle path there um, where we want room for religion. We just don't know what it is. Um, and I think it's okay to live with that question. I think more of us should maybe, or more of us should be more interested in what's that like? What's it like to live with a religious question versus answering it? Um, but yeah. I love that. I love that. I, I mean, I, 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 I feel like, I feel like I'm I'm gradually opening to um the possibilities of a could I call it a Riverian indoctrination. 
<laughs> but I'm gonna call the riparian indoctrination to 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 live with the religion as question as opposed to living it with it as a complete answer and 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 you know and uh, you know I I do see you know for example our culture so like my understanding is like when I was in my early twenties I feel like our culture was in a rational phase that was like marked by the new atheist phenomenon. Like we can get rid of spirit and re we, not only like, you know, it's not a choice between spirit and religion. It's a choice between it's, it's both are both are uh, both can be handled by reason. <laughs> right. And, you know, and, and then I feel like our culture went through a spiritual phase with like, you know, more people going to meditation, yoga, um, all sorts of different sort of, let's say maybe psychedelics, but the, but there's that tagline of I'm spiritual but not religious. Um, even like this idea like that we could have the sacred without the religious covering to it. Um, but now I feel like that's fallen apart, and there's like this return of the religious, um, and there's this sort of need for people to identify with a religious organization or find a religious organization, um, and. For me, I don't know what I think about all this, but like, like I said, I, I, I don't seem to have a way to get into contact with the inside of religion in a way that some people seem to be able to do. I'm always only able to see it from the outside. And I feel good there, but at the same time, I feel like religion as a question is quite appealing. Mm -hmm. So where, yeah, so so where does that take you, religion as a question? I know you're in a religious studies program. Yeah. Um, yeah, what what types of things are you wrestling with? I guess that's the best way to say it. How do you wrestle with religion as a question? So the the first thing that that popped up to my mind when you talk about like you want to know what's the inside of religion like, I I want to say maybe we shouldn't mystify it too much because, and I, and I think that's always the danger of talking about even religious experiences. Like let's not mystify it too much because the real question is what are we really talking about when we talk about religious experiences? Because even the term religion, and this is like what they, you know, throw down my brain in religious studies is like the term religion itself is a 17th century term. It's like, so what are we actually talking about? I didn't and the same, yeah, yeah, the, the yeah the term religion is a 17th century term, and then when we talk about Roman and Greek religion, you wouldn't come up to them and be like, "Oh, so you're religious or what?" Like, no, religious life was just life. It was just culture, and it was just life. Um, like every bit of divine was in relation to the government, to the state, to how people behaved. Like, you can't just say like. This is a theological city. No, it was just life. They had no concept of of religion as such. Um, so when when we're talking about this uh, idea of like religious experience or or religion, whatever, it's like what we're really talking about, in my opinion, is life gave me a question, and I don't know how to answer it, and I'm always tempted in answering it. And the problem is, when you answer that question, you strip out the possibilities. What I mean by people, what, what I mean by living with the religious question is, what are possibilities that you could be interested in and that you might find worth living in? That's really it. It's, it's, really, it's really about maintaining a curiosity or being very curious about the ways that you can answer this. And to me, that's kind of living with the religious question. Um, there's no harm in answering it for you, but I also think it might be better to be curious first about what those possibilities are. Um, and the more dangerous part is that we really lack a kind of like imagination right now because the only thing that's sold to us is very um, unimaginative possibilities, in my opinion. And it's even more threatening to think about what are the possibilities beyond those options. 
Can you go into that? Like what, what, when you say the only thing being sold to us are unimaginative possibilities, what do you see? Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's exactly like the whole uh, archetype of the conservative and the um, like liberal, right? It's, you can either have a life with meaning and fulfillment and it's okay to not have any freedom basically, or um, you can just have pure, uh, pure freedom, but no meaning and fulfillment. Like it's, like why 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 is that why is that only two ways of living and why is that always sold as prescriptive um and it's the same thing with like how men sell themselves on youtube like um jordan peterson and and so on there's always like for them it's always one way of being a man but it's very clear there's multiple ways of being a man like that that's why i'm saying that there's such a lack of imagination because if we lack imagination we have to depend on these charismatic figures in some ways because we don't know what to do the question that i would like to pose is well maybe there's other options maybe there's other things that we could be interested in the thing is what is that and what that might be look like and that involves us being curious or being fascinated right dealing with this loss of maybe not answering the religious question um, and just being more curious about what a life, what's a life that I would like to live and what's a life that will allow others to live. Um, how deeply have you felt into that question? I mean, I've only begun kind of really diving into that question, but I do think after my conversation with my group yesterday, I do think it kind of begins with, let's not be afraid of other people's beliefs. Um, I think that's a good start. Um, and then we have to think about, you know, is it, because if you really think about this, is it really necessary for people to have theological knowledge or or whatever? I think it might be more of just like, we don't need to be afraid because if, if we're not afraid of people's beliefs, then the the emphasis of the risk of knowledge wouldn't be so threatening, I would say. Because it would seem that we want to increase our knowledge when we're really afraid of other people's beliefs. Because a lot of us culminate knowledge to negate the other, to you know negate them, right? Get rid of them. And I'm not interested in 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 kind of increasing my knowledge to get rid of the other in some sense or, or rid of the other person's beliefs. What I want is, in general, a more communal curiosity, right? Like. I just want this to be, I don't want it to be dogmatic in the sense like you have to be curious. I just want us to possibly be like, I, I'm thinking of the word seduction. Like seduction or flirtation doesn't mean that you commit to the thing. It means you're curious about it. It attracts you. You're wondering about it. Um, I think there needs to be more seduction in that sense. More seduction about what are the possibilities. And it doesn't mean you have to embrace them, but I'm just, I just want people to be curious about it. Can we disentangle seduction from what we were talking about with charis charisma and the problem of charisma and authority? And, you know, how do we be seductive or flirtatious um, in, a, in a way where the seduction and the flirtation is the thing and not like we're trying to get some object which closes the thing? Yeah, I guess my question is like, how do we disentangle seduction from the charisma and the problems that that could bring? Yeah, oh, man, that's a good question, man. Because like, really, I think what's so hard to like delineate for people is that the charisma is the seduction itself. And you, the thing is the the other part of that seduction is you don't have to, you don't have to go into it. Like, you don't have to take that as as the prescription, right? Whatever the correct charismatic person is saying, you don't have to take that as a prescription. But, but you can take that as, that's just one way of living. And I can be very curious about that. I'm allowed to be curious about that. I'm allowed to be intrigued by that possibility of living. The temptation is really on the back end where you feel such a pressing need to answer it. Or, or you feel like such a pressing need to be like, okay, this is the only answer. 
Um, because once you feel that you have given your only answer, it, it, it relieves an existential burden from you. Like, yes, okay, I got it. But then you're more, you, but then you're with another question of like, well, now what do you do? Now, what do you do after you've accepted this? And I think that's also when the problem of other people starts really surfacing, right? Versus us seeking. So the the problem of other people to me is is the central one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, like that's like like to me that's like and and that like maybe even as a through line to me of our conversation like unlike like what's sort of like clarified for me in our conversation is like. The problem of the afterlife, to me, that's not the problem. It's not, it, it was never really the super big problem. Mm -hmm. I guess I sort of avoided the problem of other people for a certain time and transposed the problem of the afterlife into sort of these types of teleological secular fantasies of like, whether it's like technological singularity or communism or like that was a phase like that I went through for a few years in my doctorate. But then that broke apart, and I think the most clear way to say it is that it's the problem of other people, which I started to experience first in an intimate relationship, sexual relationships, and then broadly speaking with work dynamics or friendship or whatever, all the other ways in which we, family, all the ways in which we relate to other people, like that's really the zero level. And where I want to take this, actually, I hope this is in some sense a, a, an interesting um, direction to take this, is that the seduction and the charisma with the problem with other people, like you can feel a negativity because you're not the charismatic one or you're not the seductive one. Like, and you struggle with, I'm like, that person's more charismatic than me or that person's more seductive than me. That person's more likable than me. That person's people enjoy being around that person more than, you know, these asymmetry, or it could be the other way where like you might be the charismatic or the seductive one. And, and then, and then other people have envy and projection and jealousy against you. And, and both of those can be difficult, right? Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's something it's, it's funny, like charisma is such a, it's, it's really odd to me that, you know, this is something my friend said too. Like, it's really odd to me that like Riz has become like a very pop popular cultural term now. Like, it's a short version for charisma. And the fact that now we're in a culture of just like, well, who's got the Riz? Oh, you got the Riz? You don't got the Riz? Um, and it really is talking about a certain level of seduction that's attractive to, to us. Um, and yes, I, I do think there's a sort of ambivalence that we have. Although I think most people would be like, I don't, I don't think I do. Um, but I do think there's a sort of ambivalence with charisma because it means that you can be sucked in, right? Like, I don't want the feeling of being sucked into something, which is actually explains some of my own uh, anxiety tendencies where I'm just like, you know, I see somebody like, uh, I'm about to go to a store and like, they're like, you know, with like a sign and clipboard. And I just know I'm going to be seduced into to signing something. And I, and I literally go, okay, today's not the day. And I just walk away. <laughs> I don't want them to be there because I know I won't be able to let up and say no, because it's actually more painful for me to be like, no, no, thank you. Like I'm good because they look at you like, well, I, I just wanted you to sign for a, a cause for saving homeless, you know, animals. Like, it, it's just like, you're just like, fuck. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I actually think that's a horrible violence that we have to experience. Like when, when I'm walking through like a, I don't know, like a mall strip or walking, even like today I walked into the grocery store and they had people there asking me to sign something. It's a really, it's violent. It's so violent. It's so, it's so violent. And the one time I, I sympathized because I overheard one of the ladies at the school, you know, she had a clipboard and she was on the phone and she was like, she goes, yeah, so they either just pretend I'm not here or they say they've already signed it, <laughs> okay? And it's funny because in that moment, I felt sympathetic because I was like, wow, so she really feels the violence too in her own regard, right? Like people just walk away, ignore her, or um, they just tell her they've already signed it, which, a way, which is a way of mitigating the violence, right? Like, no, I signed it. You, you wouldn't be able to prove I haven't. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, you guys have probably been sitting out here for days. So like, you know, I signed it already. Um, but yeah, it, it, it really is violent. Um, and I think that might explain some of the ambivalence we have about charismatic people is just like the other side of as much as people want to be sucked in and it's seductive, it's also that same thing. I'm sucked in. I don't want to be sucked in. What if I get sucked in completely? And there's a way of flirtation, and Adam Phillips talks about this, that always has a derogatory term or a derogatory connotation to it, meaning like flirtation for us means like you're about to commit to it. You're about to do something. But that doesn't actually mean that's going to happen. It's just we don't like flirtation because it means that you could do something. And that's the real frustration when you see your partner maybe flirting with somebody else. It's like, you know, like, is she like, she's committed to me. Like, why is she, in my perception, flirting, you know? And so there's a really threatening nature to flirting. But I think there's another way to look at flirting. And I've been playing with this term, like flirting with the absolute. I think we'd rather flirt with the absolute than do the kind of thing with it. Um, flirting with the absolute for me means something like, I'm really intrigued and interested by it. I'm attracted to it. I'm pulled by it. But I don't do the thing that makes me cross over. I don't make it mine. Like I, I just flirt with it. I don't make it mine. I don't attempt to make it mine because in some sense, I'm still committed. <laughs> I'm committed to the religious question. So I flirt with the absolute. Now you're... you're... You're building you're you're building a a community of 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 sorts um and and you said that you're aiming for a communal curiosity, which I love that that way of thinking about it. Um, where have you experienced or do have you experienced sort of problems of um, either dogma or charisma have 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 these issues already come up in the community mm, i mean drama like in my my idea of established like curiosity community of curiosity or just like community in general um like i guess with the with the book club that you started that's right um i haven't i haven't encountered any problems yet mainly because the people that are there are, you know a lot of the same people that i've already had relations with but there have been some new people that have propped up and i and i think um i've really just kind of let let a lot of the pressure go so like because i'm running it i do think i definitely take my role in whether it becomes very dogmatic or not <laughs> you know um and also if you're the you know person in charge like you can just cut off the person before they get dogmatic or, or whatever but i do think um I've been really just preaching about in some ways about just like, just talk about whatever you find interesting. Like we don't need to read in a way that we're regurgitating everything that we're saying or, or feel confident about what we're saying. But what does happen when you read something, it doesn't matter whether it's philosophical or fiction, is that certain lines are very interesting to you. Either because it poses a question, like it makes you question, what is this? What does this mean? Like you got stuck on it or or there's a specific line that just really seduced you. You're like, I really love that line. And I would be like, okay, talk about that. Like talk about that line. Talk about what struck your curiosity. And then I, I've also been doing the same thing with like when people talk, like I'd rather do a kind of free association curiosity. Like I'm listening, but also at the same time, we have to admit that we're not perfect listeners. So- what makes good conversation now, in my opinion, is we just free associate and pick off what we find interesting from what what any any anybody of us is saying, and it gets really fascinating. <laughs> fragments, yes, for isolated fragments that 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 for some for some mysterious reason pique our interest as opposed to some perfect whole where we understood everything. Mm -hmm. Correct. I, I mean, in some in some sense, that's that's kind of what I try to do in a podcast is like, you know, I might not 
understand the entire sort of riff someone's going on, but something will stick out and be like, let's let's go down that rabbit hole um, and follow that thread and see where it leads. But I love, of course, free association is really a central tool here. Um, fascinating so maybe i guess my question would be if people want to get involved in this in this community could you maybe say a little bit more about what your hopes are for it and and how they could take the steps to get involved if they feel so inclined yeah so my <laughs> my concept i think my concept has a little bit changed but more like the here's my ambivalent part about community in general is that the fear of sustaining one always risks a kind of dogmatic or hierarchical structure. Like it always risks one. It just always does, I think, in my opinion. Um, but I can say this. I, I want to be less afraid about the death of a community. I think that's what I, and I want to be, I want to establish a community that's less afraid about a community dying. Because I, I think that's also not what's talked about is like, as much as there's a need for community, I think there's as much a need for the opposite, meaning it should be okay if a community dies. And in some ways, that's what I'm, 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 I kind of want to foster. Like, I don't want to be the head honcho of my community and be like, this is my community and this is how we label ourselves and so on. What I want is, I want people to be curious about community. And then I also want people to be okay with if it dies. It's okay if it dies. I don't want to like, I mean, like, uh, I don't know what's his name. Um, I, I don't want it a thing where I have to like work and be like, okay, I want to do this full time. I don't want to be like that only because for me, it's like there's two fears on opposite ends, right? There's, I have to commit myself to the community because if it dies, I'm really afraid of that. Um, and I, I want to make sure it thrives. And the only way that community can thrive is with me. And that's what I don't want. I don't want to be the one where the community thrives because it has to be me in the picture. What I want is I want people to be curious about community. And I want people to be curious about what that might be like. And I would say my community is one of those curiosities that, that's available to people if they want. If they want. If you want to talk about books, if you want to talk about other things, if you, if you just want to talk about what you're interested in um, and what intrigues you, I think that's what my community is there for, you know. And of course, I'm kind of curating a selection list of what we're reading, but I think it's starting to slowly open up in terms of like, I want to be more curious about other things. So hopefully that kind of answers. Yeah. And if people do want to get involved, uh, where where can they find? I can leave a link in the description, but what's the be what's the best way? Um, the best way would be like my Patreon. Um, they can go through my Patreon and like, you know, they don't it's not like you have to you don't have to pay anything to be a part of the book club or anything. Uh, usually I take the membership of is like you just want to support the community, like you just want to support um, me and, and whatever, because I mean. There's a part that I can't deny, right? The fact that it does take my time and the fact that it does take some of my financial resources to kind of have it. And that's why people work and people work to sustain the community and so on. But I just left it open to just like, kind of like a donation. <laughs> like the membership is kind of like a donation. Like if you want to, but you don't have to be, um, you don't have to pay. You can be a part. Um, but it seems like a lot of people decided to donate anyways so um that's nice lovely well javier i think it's been really interesting talking to you here about your story i mean i've always appreciated your work ever since i found you i think one of the most consistent things i always say is that i'm just always impressed with how personally reflective you are and in including your knowledge in your personal journey um and i thought that was one of the great reasons why uh it would be fun to have you on the singularities podcast um, I guess with a final thought, is there anything you'd like to leave uh, people listening with in terms of um, the religious path and sort of spirituality in general, if we could say it like that? Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I would just say, you know, um, <laughs> it's it's always hard because I always want to give advice from hindsight, but I would just uh, I would say this: 
just don't be afraid of your curiosity. <laughs> you know, try to be less afraid of your curiosity. Um, and and it's okay to flirt with the absolute, like you're not denying anything by flirting. <laughs> I love that. Well, I love that, Javier, and I I, I love your riz. So thank you for being, <laughs> thank you for being you. And uh, for everyone still listening, have a great evening. For courses exploring the foundation of modern philosophy, as well as live events bringing philosophy to life, visit philosophyportal.online and become a member today. Throughout 2024, our members get access to four monthly events and also access to all historical recordings from our previous private events, including events with Lehman Pascal, Alenka Zupancic, Elliot Rosenstock, Carl Hayden Smith, David McCarricker, Alex Ebert, Andrew Davis, Ruth Kastner, and Matthew Segal. Find out more at philosophyportal.online.